Okay, this is a part two of the same lecture I was just continuing, and we're going to look at a uh, continuation of phone activity, which is actually a continuation of the sensor stuff that we looked at yesterday, uh, which is on the agenda for today. So dealing with the phone itself, there's three basic concepts associated with this. We're going to get the information about the phone and about the network that the phone is running on. Essential parallel functions to support querying of the phone connectivity, data connectivity. So we have all of these different activities that occur uh, and that are registered by the phone. So when an incoming call comes in, when an outgoing call is made, we can intercept that with the activity. Can we hold it down so I don't have to yell? Thank you. All right, so... <laughs> We can monitor the phone and the data usage, and we can initiate outgoing calls and stuff like that. So if you have an Android device that's working on a carrier like Verizon, as an example, which is the only one I can really attest to because I have a Verizon device, they actually make their own apps that do the same thing. They're Android apps that are monitoring the activity, so you can see at any one moment of time how many cell phone minutes you've used, how many data minutes you've used, and stuff like that, um, which happens on phones and tablets and things. They're all written using these concepts. And so you can build the sensors from the phone activity into the app design to create a, a lot of sort of custom kind of behaviors. You cannot directly swap out the standard in-call phone screen if you're using an actual built-in phone process. But you can override certain things so that, as an example, this is how Google Voice works. So you can install Google Voice as an app, override what's going on so that when the phone comes in, Instead of stopping it, you can't stop the activity, but when, it, when a, a call is actually coming in, you can put up a little dialogue and say, hey, do you want to catch it on your cellular service or do you want to catch it on your, ver your um, vo Google Voice service? And then you can select an option. And if you are not familiar with this, this is pretty much how it, uh, the old interface used to work um, in terms of the dialogue where you can actually select how you want to receive this call. Um, so. You have some options you can do. You can't override the concept, though, of the phone coming in or the call coming in. So telephony manager and permissions. So like most of the other hardware-based functionality, you have to use a manager for it. So sensor manager, location manager, phone manager. So we have the telephony manager. So we create a new instance of the telephony manager, and we get the system service. This should start looking familiar to you. We've seen this a couple of times already with location and different other types of services. And in here, we're getting the system service, and we're going to use the context of the telephony service. So we can interpret it, and we can actually create our own dialer if we want to. We can create our own telephone receiver. So request permission also to get the phone and monitor this. So you have to set a permission for it. So not only do you have to create a new manager to monitor the activity and work with it, but you need to set some permissions in the manifest. So here we have users permission, and this is going to be read phone state as an example. Um, that, that will allow you to work with that. So it's, it's very similar. Looking at the phone information itself is extremely similar to all of the other sensors that we've looked at so far. So in terms of the phone and the network information, uh, what we have going on here is uh, an example showing the activity. And the activity that we're looking at is uh, for a new telephony manager, telephony manager and an on create. We're going to have uh, in our phone example the information that's going to be shown. This is for a Verizon operator, actually. Um, but it's just an activity that's going to show us the information that's associated with the service of the telephony. So we have to set the permission, and then once we set the permission, we can go on the on create. We can create a new instance of the telephony manager in this particular case here, and then we can update with all of the information. We can get telephony manager, get device ID, get software version, get line number. So we can get all of our information that's being held by the service um, from the telephony manager, which is kind of an interesting thing. If you wanted to, you can actually cut and paste this and put it into an uh, Android app and then run it. And then you can see, well, what information is being advertised out of the telephony service for my particular app so that I can, um, you know, I don't know, see what's being advertised <laughs> or see what, see what information is available. And then you can read and write to it and set the certain information as well. So. Well, a lot of different uses is for it. It depends on what you're going to do, um, if you're going to interpret it and listen to it. So. so listening to changes in the phone state. So you have to extend the phone state listener class, not in implements, extends, makes a subclass. Um, 
we have to essentially extend the phone listener state. Instead of making your class do this, you can. Uh, it would be difficult if you wanted to extend another class like activity or map activity. Use an anonymous inner class inside of the class as well. These are some of the methods that are associated with it that you can call and use from this object. One of them might be to uncall forwarding indicator change, um, uncall state changed, on data activity. So on a data activity, you can count up how many minutes of data you're using as an example, how many minutes of phone service. Um, you know, there's a lot of different things you can do if you're tracking and monitoring the phone activity. Um, so you can add a code to define any of the responses to support up to the nine updates that you might receive as well. So, so you can also request a telephony manager to listen for such events and then unrequest when you're done listening to something, you can set a request to listen and then set a request not to listen. And then we have an example of an incoming call um, and service chart changes on the next slide. But another important note that um, to keep in mind as well is that when you're listening and you're uh, setting something out to actively listen and monitor, you're going to probably not wear the batteries down as fast as when you're using the map services or location services, but it does provide a drain. Um, which is why, if you haven't noticed it, when you turn your service off for the internet, turn your service off for 3G or for cellular service, your phone lasts a lot longer. <laughs> your battery charge will last a lot longer that way. Well, if you have that service running, which you can't turn off, load another one on top of it to also search for it, that's also going to drain your battery a lot faster as well. Um, so just keep in mind, it's uh, like any other other types of sensors on the phone. You're, if you're going to initiate the sensor and you're going to have the sensor work for you on double overtime or whatever, you're going to end up with a situation in which um, your uh, battery is not going to last as long. So. Uh, so let's see, this example coming up here is how to monitor for incoming phone calls and service changes. Uh, so here we have a phone listener uh, that we're going to put in here, a phone li state listener, and uh, a little app that you can load up here that's going to basically keep track of what's going on with the phone service, when a call has been received, when it's been picked up, when it's been hung up and stuff. So if you cut and paste this code, stick it into an Android project, it will work for you. And what's it going to do? It's going to do, show you just a, a quick kind of summary of all of these different states that your phone service is going to go through. Why do you need to do that? I don't know, for the same reason why, you know, getting the information that's provided by the provider um, or by the service itself. Uh, ability to work with it for some application development purpose. So um, being able to know, like, when a phone is hung up, it could update some sort of a status indicator or perhaps send a message out or keep track of something for you or something like that. Um, so it will continue to be updated while uh, you respond to an incoming call so and unless you ignore a call. So, Which is kind of interesting because it does, will run, this app will definitely run in, uh, in, in this example runs in the background, continuously picks up things. So in terms of initiating a call, you can exploit the intent called a action call and action dial to send a phone number um, as a URI. So it's all done using intents. And as we know with the uh, contact providers, excuse me, pro uh, resource providers, content providers, excuse me, all intent driven. So we use an intent to actually work with the um, phone services as well. Action dialer um, to open up a, a default dialer with a loaded number. Action call uh, to dial actually with the, the phone itself. Yeah, yeah, need phone service because you need the service running. But you can initially, um, oh, you can actually create your own dialer. Uh, no problem at all. You're just replacing the default. You're not replacing the default. You're just supplementing the default dialer with your dialer. So requires a phone uh, call phone permission. And it requires a call privilege permission if you want to allow dialing for emergency numbers. Why all the permissions are uh, given in here? Well, that's a good question. While it's separated out, that's another good question. But it's a way for the manifest to pretty much, uh, which is <coughs> sort of the security feature of your phone. But it's a way for that to kind of control and regulate all of the different activity that's happening. And so when you're installing an app and it says call privilege on it, I'm like, do I want my app to dial 911 for me? I'm not quite sure about that, you know. If I want it to do, you know, 
something like 411. I don't know, the service charges might apply. I might be hesitant installing that app that's going to give me that warning ahead of time. But what if it's an emergency calling app? You know, like maybe it's for the elderly or something and you've fallen down and I can't get up. <laughs> you just press a button or something and it calls 911 for you or something, you know. That's actually a pretty easy app to put together. So here's an app that initiates call and here it is actually. And you can enable the uh, call privilege and then you can have a little button that says call 911 and you're going to have an emergency contact button there. Well, another thing actually people have done, it makes a little sense. You don't want to keep remembering numbers. You don't want to thumb through a phone book. Just create a little menuing system and just press on stuff and it calls people. <laughs> All my active, you know, it's just as easy to navigate probably through a menuing system of a contact list. But uh, in this particular case, it might make it easier for certain situations or something. Also, for example, if you have uh, an app with a built-in hard set number for technical support, you just press it and calls technical support or something. I can see that happening. <laughs> as well. I'm sorry? Speed it's like speed dialing, yeah. Call the client, call for support, something like that. And uh, just like the intense work, it actually will initiate a call through your local dialer app or your dialer service on the phone. So here's an example of the source code for it. Uh, you can cut and paste it and uh, use it to see, to dial a number and see which effect might actually come out of that. So overriding the phone system for outgoing, you can implement your own phone system voice over IP and then register it as an option for the dialing of the phone on the phone. So you have to register it as an option so that when you go to initiate a call, it'll pick up and say, do you want to use Google Voice or do you want to use or my Google Voice or whatever you want to call it, or do you want to use uh, the regular phone service? So it requires using an intent filter. We've already seen how to use intents in, in the class itself, but... Uh, Basically, uh, your app will advertise. Uh, basically, where you where you app advertises what it will be responding to is set in the manifest, so that when you are initiating a call, it will actually use your your own voice over IP. There's actually some apps out there that will working on top of other APIs. There's a couple of them that work on top of Google Voice actually. That will you can create your own instance or your own app that uses voice over IP services, register it with an intent filter so that when a call comes through and it intercepts the regular one, brings it over your IP, voice over IP line, or when you initiate a call, it actually sends it out over your voice over IP line instead of over your cellular line. So, which is how Google Voice is actually working on the phone system itself. So, so that was a little bit I wanted to give you on phone services. Just know that you can bypass that the same way as we bypass the text message service so we can bypass all of the other services as well on the device which makes it kind of interesting in terms of its implementation now I have a couple more um, examples to give you actually two more yes this whole service, the next step would be like how to bill the customer right and, and to bill it I need to store the, this uh, access uh, user history so to store it I cannot have it stored on his system yeah, you know what the cellular companies do? They monitor it on the phone, and then once a month or twice a month, they upload it to their server. Your phone actually sends the information to the server. Oh, but I can delete it from my phone. I know, but it's still stored. You cannot delete it. You can delete what you can see, but you can't delete what it's carrying. It's automatically, every time you authenticate, it's automatically updating. <laughs> it may not update constantly. It probably only updates a couple of times. But it will definitely collect it for you. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's how I'm yeah. So it doesn't really matter. You can clear it off on your phone, but it will keep some of it private, so it, you're not clearing that private information off. Yeah, you're not going to have access to mm -hmm. it. But uh, probably in a database or something is where it's storing it. It'll query Maybe it. Like up. the way we were looking at, it has permission, like specific permission on the folder. Mm -hmm. It's like application owners. Yeah. Uh, each carrier is probably going to have a slightly different technique for it, but it's definitely, there's, usually when you get a device that's from a carrier that's going to charge you for service, there's apps, Verizon is classic for this, they have their own apps <laughs> that are running, and you can't stop those services. If you stop the services, then you violate your agreement, you lose your, you lose your connectivity, essentially. So the 
phone isn't going to work and the authentication isn't going to work unless those services are running. Those services are tracking and keeping okay. track of all the accounting of all the calls you've made and all the data you've downloaded mm -hmm. and everything. And it's just going to update the server on whatever schedule it's set to do it with. Mm -hmm. If it's not running, you're not going to get access. So. Yeah, but uh, that, that is fine when it is running. Like, I'm, I'm, like Google Voice, I'm yeah. putting on top of it. So what actually Google puts in along with the application? That is it just bypasses it so you're not using it. <laughs> Google Voice, I'm not quite sure how the, the, the free service, which is the only thing I'm familiar with, uh, it just rides on top of everything else. It makes actually makes your phone battery go down a little bit more because it's constantly monitoring for incoming calls. So it's attached to the service. So then a call comes in, it's going to give you a choice. Do you want to have the cellular service do it or do you want Google Voice to do it? Or you can actually set it so it bypasses it. But your cellular service still gets pinged. It's still coming through your cellular network. You still get a charge for a second or so, or a minute, depending upon what the billing is. And then that, if you're being charged by the minute, you, sometimes you just have unlimited, so you don't really even notice it. But long story short, it's just still going to come in. You can't stop that service from capturing it. And then it's just going to go from there to your Google Voice. just And then it ends, and your Google Voice takes over. Because your Google Voice is going to run as a separate app. That's going to interpret it, uh, intercept it, excuse me, and pick it up. So which is kind of a nice, a nice little bypass way of doing it. And that's just, you can write your own Google Voice. You can write your own Voice over IP. You just get the API for it, and then you write your own. Just like writing your own map application. You can write your own Google Voice as well. So. All right, so the next uh, example, I'm just going to run through it actually with you. Um, it is called a simple notification, and uh, it is downloadable on the website. There's two. There's one more uh, tab, so I'm going to show you tabbed. We'll go through the tab tutorial in a few minutes. Notifications was the other one, I believe. Notifications is uh, well, it's in this list somewhere, but it's uh, another way of interpreting, uh, intercepting the uh, signals that are coming through for the automatic notification. So let me run it for you, and I can basically show you what it's doing first and then we'll look at the source code for it. It is downloadable from that directory I just showed you a few minutes ago. So yesterday we talked about notifications and this is the example that goes along with it. This is a very old project style so you can see and I, I kinda like to kept this around because you can sort of see the motif is a little different so the styling is back from like two point something which is kinda cool. So I have a send notification, and you see when I click the send button, I see up at the top here, I've got this notification. So if I pull the notification down, it says browse Android official site by clicking me. If I click on this one here, I click on the notification, it's going to bring up my web browser. <laughs> it's going to browse the Android official site because I, I just clicked on it. So I sent a notification to myself that allowed me to... Uh, to go to this website here after I clicked on it. So if I go back to the app that called it, I've got another button here that canceled it. So I press the cancel button and I can see now I have no notification out there. So I can send in my notification again. <laughs> so then I can go click me. So you can clear it yourself from the notification bar normally or you can cancel it from the app. So let me show you the code for that. We actually went over the lecture stuff for it yesterday, so this was the example that I needed to show you that associated with it. There's only one class right here. There's no, uh, there's no nothing else, <laughs> no menus or anything. Uh, so simple notification. And uh, what are we doing in here? We're creating an instance of the notification manager, and we have a, you know, just a, a simple integer value that we're going to keep track for the notification ID. And then on the onCreate, we're going to make an instance of the notification manager. And then we're going to use the buttons. So we have two buttons, button start and button cancel. And uh, we're going to create a new notification here that's going to be in the form of an alert. And the alert's going to say, uh, click me, new alerts. And it's going to show the, well, it's going to be set from a drawable Android, drawable Android, which is going to be the, image that shows up so if you look at it if you remember there's like a little Android image that's uh, that's the old image actually so you're if you build this in a well if you load this example you'll see the old one because it's in the example but if you build it fresh just by cutting and pasting this company and a new one you'll see the newer Android uh, drawable image 
So we set the title and we set the notification there. And then uh, here's where we're getting the text down here. So on the click, when we click it, we're getting this information. So we have the two buttons, start button and cancel button. And we're going to set the listener on the buttons. And on the click listener, on the click, we're going to set the context to get the application context. And then character sequence, we're going to set the context title to notification details. And in the details, that's where it says browse the Android official website uh, by clicking me. So all that text that showed up in there was set from here, from the context uh, text. So we have an intent here where the intent is going to be used and we have a pending intent which means it's not going to be run until we click on it. <laughs> so we haven't switched back. We still have it running because I was able to get, press the escape key and go back to the, um, app, the activity that was running. But the pending intent is uh, going to be set to make, make it out there, make it available. When I click on it, then it runs. So if I come back over here and set this again. The notification's up here, but nothing's happening. So when I open it up, then I see the, the populate, populated field. If I'm able to click on it here, oops, can't get it open now. Oops, oh well. I was able to open it a few minutes ago. You saw the activity work. <laughs> so my mouse isn't behaving right now. Uh, but what did I do? Pull it down completely? Yeah, there we go. I have to pull it down completely. And uh, the pending intent delayed it. The intent's now working right now. Now I'm on the Android website, uh, android.com. And so uh, I could essentially put other things on there. I've just pressed the back button. Uh, this activity is still running. So I can cancel it and do whatever with it. So the cancel button is not really doing very much at all. Cancel. It's uh, saying cancel. <laughs> and this is the ID that we set up for it. The notification manager is notify. So we set an integer value to say that this is the notification. So we could send multiple notifications over and over again. We're sending one that's going to happen over. So if I hit the notification button over and over, so we have a send notification. Send notification, send notification. You see, I'll just click it many times here. Now we'll click it down here and see what we get. Only one. Because <laughs> we're associating it with an integer value. And we're replacing it again and again with the same value. So if we wanted to, we can increment the value. And we could have and we can have notification number one, notification number two, notification number three. Now we're just setting notification number one, notification number one, notification number one. So I'm not getting thousands of them to show up. I'm only getting one of them to show up. Which is kind of irritating when you have like 25, I hate that when you have like 25 text messages or you know, it's just you know, intent after intent after intent after intent. I get that on my phone with the email program with Google email. And I got the five little envelopes that show up. Also just tell me I've got mail. I don't need a five different notifications for each one of those messages that came through. So that's what this is doing, actually. It's only loading up one, and, and it's using the number that's associated with it. So simple. this is the number that's up here, actually. It's an integer value <coughs> to keep track of it. So it doesn't really matter what the value is. It's just using that one. And then uh, to cancel, it just knows which one to, to cancel because of the value that's being set for it. So. And anyway, we can see it's not too many lines of code. It's just a, um, you know, an onCreate method and then an onClick listener for the buttons here. We have the two buttons that we're uh, going to implement the listener for, the onClick event. And uh, it's fairly simple. Uh, we are just essentially setting, uh, you know, just setting the, here's the URI that's going to be parsed for the action on the intent. This is what the intent's doing, actually. When you click on it, the intent notify intent, which is what we're calling it. It's just going to create a new intent, which is going to be an action view. Well, that's going to show up. It's going to pull up the default web browser that's on the phone and load in this URI that we're sending out. The URL, excuse me, that we're sending out, which is the Android URL. Excuse me? On the click? When we click? Oh. Right here is the initialization for it. Yes. The details are coming through on the for the context. 
content con the, the, the context is being set to notify details. Don't do that. Don't do that. Context style, context. We have created it in our notification. Yeah. That's where we're, we're, we create all the details for it and then on the on create we created it. So we're just populating it with all of the information that's associated with it. So if we do that, then we can have, that's a good question actually. We can have several buttons. One button says create an intent, or uh, set an Android notification. The next one underneath it says set another notification, set another notification underneath that or something. Yeah, actually, that's a that's a good question. <laughs> so, the on create menu, the on create when the app's created, it essentially is creating the notification for us with all of the details that we've set here. So we're setting the notification details to the notification that's going to be what we're actually putting out there. But it's not going to show up out there until we use the intent for it. So we actually kind of created a separate activity for it, which is not really an activity; it's a notification. So once we create the notification, we could experiment with this and have several different buttons that do different types of notifications all in the same way. So. Good question. Anything else on the notifications? That, that was the one I needed to show you from uh, last time. So uh, I will get rid of this. Well, actually, we'll just leave this one alone. The last tutorial for the course is the one on tabs, actually, uh, which is kind of an interesting one. Rather than cutting and pasting and building it, I'm just going to go through the tutorial for you, and I have the finished product loaded up. You're also going to want to, if you're going to do this, you're going to download the finished product as well, and that's one is going to be out here in the tabs. Oh, let's take a look here. It should be located out here. <coughs> and the tutorials folder. And this one's here, tutorial uh, tabs, tutorial tab solution. This solution has the images in it as well. You just need this one if you're going to go into the tutorial without loading up the solution. So if we take a look at this one here, in this one we're going to create what's called a tab application. Let me show it to you. It's a nice little final kind of tutorial to look at because it kind of shows you the big picture in terms of the application design. If I run the project, I get something that looks like this. Oops. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Give it a few minutes so it will load. Here we go. So I got some tabs on the top, and when I click on the tabs up here, I see that the bottom where it says videos here, songs here, photos here. It's a you can put the tabs on the top of the screen, tabs on the bottom of the screen. If you're familiar with the iOS, there's a tab template. When you see this, you go, that's a lot more work than the tab template, but it's a similar concept, actually, in terms of what's going on. We have a separate activity file for each one of the three, and the activity files are pretty much doing the same thing. And we set the on-click event. There's actually two separate images that are showing up. So if you see this one here, there's like multiple people in the background, and then we have one person, and then we have this little microphone, and then we have this little note that shows up. So when you click on it, this, this microphone turns into a musical note. This video thing here turns into a, a different video image. So the images, you know, I probably could have come up with some better choices, but they, they change when the item is selected. So, and these are kind of, well, kind of like fake little tabs that are set up that, well, they're not fake, they work, actually, <laughs> but uh, they're just basically loading on the on-click event, they're just loading up a different activity on the lower part of the screen. So it's changing, it's changing um, the title. Actually, it's not changing the title, it's just changing the image. We'll see this in a few minutes, actually. So, um, so let's take a look at the uh, tutorial, see how this thing is built. And as, as I mentioned before, I'm not going to build it live. I'll just run through and you know, demo it with the, with the final product. So if you created an Android project, call it tabs, and then open up the main activity, uh, tab activity as follows, and ignore any depreciated methods. We're going to extend tab activity. So if we take a look here, at the, uh, the source code and the finished product, actually. 
And the main activity is this one here. And in the main activity, this is depreciated, actually, which is why I'm not going to build it. It's, a, it's the old template that they used to use for it. Um, so there's a new, I can add a message to, uh, to suppress the depreciated method. but uh, Or we could just leave it alone. Uh, but it's tab activity instead of activity. So now we have a different, uh, there's a different way of doing this, actually. Uh, but long story short, what we did here was we added one, two, three more activities. And each one of these activities, here we have photo activity, extends activity, songs activity, extends activity, videos activity, extends activity. All it's doing is essentially setting the context view. If we take a look at the layouts in the resource folder here, under the, uh, we have one for the main activity. We have a photos, we have a sign, and basically they all look the same, except for which we have a tab <laughs> up here. So we have a tab widget, a tab widget that's showing up on the top here, and then we've put underneath it these guys here. It says photos here, and it says songs here, and then it says videos here, which is where we're getting those four different layouts, or three different layouts that are showing up for the three different tabs that we've selected. So it's a fairly basic, kind of simple design. Uh, but it kind of shows you how you could put different layouts together in terms of the big picture. So let's take a look at the main activity here. In the main activity, we have a tab host object that we're creating, which is going to show up at the top of the screen there that's going to hold all the pictures. And we have a tab for photos, a tab for songs, a tab for video. All the code is pretty much the same. It's probably a more efficient way of doing this. It's kind of redundant. Uh, we're just setting the title, setting the image. So here we have uh, an intent photos intent, an intent for songs intent. So we're using an intent. Anytime you're switching activities, which we're doing here, we're switching the activities between these different options that we have. We're going to use an intent to switch it. Um, and so when we use the intent, we're just going to load in this example, songs activity, photos activity, videos activity. And we're setting the indicator here, getting the resource for the drawable icons, the video tab, icon tabs. When we take a look at the drawable directory here, we have the different icons that are set. We have one for white and one for gray, so which is the code we're using to kind of gray it out. Because what you'd normally do is have it selected and or have it grayed out. So the ones that aren't selected are normally grayed out, and the ones that are selected are um, darker in color, so or they're white um, in this particular case. So we're setting the images. So then we add then the tab specs to the tab host. So the tab host dot add tab, add tab, which is going to be the method to add this tab spec. So we have the tab sections that are added to the tab host, which is how this is being put together. Um, which is actually kind of basic um, when you think about it, but it looks pretty sophisticated for most people when they look at it. They go, oh, that looks pretty interesting. We have these tabs on the top. Very common interface actually. Um, but it's probably one of the most simplest things to do. So, so if you go through the instructions for it, what you're doing is essentially adding uh, the main layout here. The main layout is going to have a tab widget on it, as we saw, and the tab web is going to have a frame layout that's inside of it that's going to essentially hold each one of the tab pieces. And we're going to add it to it programmatically, so it's going to populate out, so it's not, it's not specified in here. It's specified when we add the images, or we add the tab specs to the tab host. Then we create the three activities and then the three XML layouts and the three tabs. Then we create the, uh, the right-click the right -click event or the package folder to create the classes. And we call them photos activity, songs activity, and video activity Java, respectively. And then we're, we're going to essentially put in the same code for each one of them. And, if you go through here, you can see it's all the same code. It's essentially going to hold, uh, lay, basically set the context view to a different layout. So in terms of the overall design, using going back to the model view controller kind of perspective here, we have a class that's created in a .java file that's opening up an XML file. And then we have the controller, which is going to be the main activity, setting out an intent for each one of the sub-tabs. And then it's a nice design. It's a nice, clean design. It really kind of sums up the model view controller kind of concept. So, And then uh, this is going to be the layout for each one of the, and they all look the same pretty much. And it's going to be a text box, a text view that's going to show the label that's going to show in each one of the layouts. 
And for each one of the tabs, you are going to put in an icon because there's going to be an opening icon that shows up for the uh, item itself. And then we're going to have, when we click on the events, changes the icon to a different one. So in here, each one of them, the design of it is to have a 48 by 48 or 32 by 32 or 24 by 24 image, depending upon which drawable directory you're going to stick these into. Or you can just put one into a default drawable folder, make it small. And then we have the Android icons that uh, will be defined in the XML file. Mm -hmm. And then a default hover over state uh, configuration. So if we look at the XML file here, we can have the state being true or false for state selected, state not selected. And then when the state is selected, in this particular case, this is the uh, icons photo tab uh, where we have um, the photos tab button that's going to have the two items in here. So if we take a look at the code here for the actual, um, let me go back here, take a look at, here's some drilling going on. <laughs> There's some construction going on. Uh, photos here, da -da -da, text size. Yeah, it's going to be in the, uh, let's say that one, drawable. Yes. Here we go. So the XML file that's going to be loaded is going to basically specify out the this drawable image or this drawable image, depending upon which one we are using for each one of the selected items. So it's just another way of determining, well, if, if we're going to use this XML file, it's going to select which drawable item we're going to put in there, depending mm -hmm. upon whether the item is selected or the item is not selected. So it's just another way of configuring the the icon selection without hard setting the icons. You could also put it in the code when you load the uh, um, on the click events, but on the selection event, which is what where, when this is actually being loaded. Yes. If we go back to here, let's see. On the uh, on well, let's see. Take a look here. The drawable icon here is using icon photos tab, which is the drawable icon photos tab, icon photos tab, icon songs, icon video. So instead of using the image, we're using the XML file. And the XML file is taking a look to see what the state is and if the state's selected or not selected, it's switching the actual file. Because the images are called photo gray, photo white, and we're using the drawable item here. So it's kind of a, not really a trick, but it's kind of an interesting way of doing it because you've got an XML file that's controlling the image selection, you know, depending upon the logic that's set in the uh, XML interface. And then in the XML interface, you're using a selector that's going to say that this item, that we have two items in here. So when not selected or when selected. So it's going from gray to white. You can just easily use a different, like an on or an off, or selected versus not selected kind of wording if you wanted to. So. Uh, whoops, which which one? Uh, that one you're never going to look at. Why are you going to look at that? Oh. Just I want to see the difference between using the XML. You want me to open up my R.java file? All right. You're never supposed to touch this file. Uh, this is going to be an auto generation. You've been opening up R.java files. <laughs> we have all of them in here. Yeah, it's not going to be anything you're going to be able to read because it, it's basically the XML code translated into Java, but it's not actually translated into Java. It's not compiled. It's the pre-compiled configuration that's going to use some sort of an interesting parser that's going to do it for you. Yeah, never open up the r.java file. Shut that file. <laughs> Don't open up that file. Don't edit that file. It's on the selected. So if we take a look here, I closed it. But let me go back to the PDF file that I had it, had it open a few minutes ago. Um, if you go through the... Uh, so you're creating three XML files for the drawable directory, you're putting them in the drawable directory, and then you're typing in the following code, which is going to essentially say item drawable is going to be equal to this, item drawable is going to be equal to that, depending upon the selected state. So it's a selector that's being used. 
and then on the icon itself you're using the selector so you're using this as the image file and the image file is going to be used as selected by the selector tag selector tag is going to say well if it's this state do this if it's that state use that so it's getting at the uh, the tag for the state selected whether it's true or not in terms of what it's going to use so depending upon which state it's in it's going to look at that and then go the one default, or the other the default is false the default is false yes and then well, if it's not, it yeah, it? yeah, th that's going to be the default. And so when it's selected and it's going to be true, then it's going to switch over to this one. And they're all the same, actually, for each one of the tabs. So, um, so once you're doing that, then you're going to add the code for the uh, tab spec and the tab host to the activity, main activity.java. And in there, this is the code we just looked at a few minutes ago, which is basically just going to add the items to the... Uh, to the tab host. So the tab specs are going to be the three tab specs we're creating. And we just did each one of them manually, setting the drawable to that XML file that's going to determine which icon is going to be selected. Now everything works. We actually have to send, uh, we have to tell the manifest about all of the intents that we're going to use. So in the manifest file, we have our um, in, uh, intent filters that we're going to put in here. Uh, that's going to essentially say that uh, we have the dot song activity, we have the video activity, and we got the photo activity. So we list the activities and then we list the um, intent filter for the main activity to switch between the different sub activities. So we have to list the activities and then put the intent in there as well. So. Now, when you're all done with that, you can uh, run it and uh, see it work. Hopefully. So, anyway, that was kind of um, one of the examples I wanted to show you because it's kind of tricky terms of using the XML files, but uh, it uh, creates a nice little tab interface. There's an upgraded uh, library for that, but it's a little bit more complicated to work with, but you can investigate that on your own, actually. So, we finished this lecture up, I believe, and we're getting down to the tail end of the information, and we have one more lecture I, I can give you, and I can probably go through this, uh, and then we can break for lunch after that. This one's called Code Style. It's only about 16 slides, don't worry. And uh, it kind of goes through and recaps some best practices when it comes to following conventions and coding uh, that meets for Java and Android, including the use of Java docs and testing and stuff like that. So following conventions, why follow it, the valuable conventions, tolerable conventions, and dubious conventions. So a lot of people find that the conventions overall are a bit, you know, kind of troublesome to follow because it takes time and energy to actually, especially if you're going to create the Java docs and stuff like that. So official Android code conventions, they're required for, if you want to code contributed to the Android project, you have to follow these conventions. Used in the official tutorials, supposedly for all of the source code for Android at developer at android.com. Suggested for code uh, submitted to the App Store any Android project that you're going to submit, you have to use these code conventions. Details are associated here. If you go into source.android.com, source, if you follow this link, you can see all of the details. I'm going to give you a summary of these conventions, uh, just to, um, you know, kind of tell you what it's about. Eclipse preference file, downloadable from the, well, from this website here, or from a section of the Android tutorial, you're going to get the same thing. Set spaces, brackets, override, so you, actually you saw me put one of those overrides in there. That's also part of the convention. So if you're marking things in the code, not necessarily associated with the code, but you're documenting the code, you're documenting things, that's part of the convention. So pros and cons of following it. Pros, consistent with the official uh, tutorials in Android source. More familiar with Android developers who join your team who are following the same convention. It's like programming at large when you're like you know, you have a group of people working together. If you're following the same conventions, it's easier to watch and look at everybody else's code in, in the group. Cons, it's inconsistent with Java code you wrote before for other non-Android projects and less familiar to other Java developers who may not know the conventions and uh, simply bothers you. Well, there's a lot of stuff you have to do that's not associated with coding. So Java developers often have strong personal preferences in terms of the way that they're writing variables and syntax as well, that you may not necessarily want it to follow the same standard or the same practice. 
Recommendations, uh, more conventions or best practices anyhow. Don't necessarily have to do them. Most um, others are either uh, neither worse nor better than alternatives. Most conventions have their pros and cons to it, long story short. Um, so. so for any Java project, here are some conventions to think in mind. And when I mean conventions, think of this as best practices or good standard practices to use when write, writing your Java code. Indentations, blocks that are nested or should be more should more should be indented more, meaning the level of indentation should go further, which is, you'll see that in a lot of the source code examples you download from the internet or you see from android.java. So for each, you're going in five steps, five steps, five steps. I have a tendency to go in one level. <laughs> I don't go actually in further and further and further. But if you're following the Java convention, you're going in for each level, you're indenting even more. You're not doing this at, at all. So, an indentation here, the blocks that are nested uh, the same should be indented the same. So if they're nested the same, you're indenting them. So this one here is indented at the same level instead of this one here where this is indented a little bit more. So they're at the same level. So, so this one has extra space in it. So That usually happens when you have uh, some code that you've uh, not formatted well. Or you've just kind of pasted it. You also want to break things into smaller parts uh, and similar pieces. So write short methods. Use official limits, uh, but try to keep methods short and focused. You don't want a huge method when you can break it down into smaller ones. Think often about um, how to refactor your code into breaking it into smaller units for reusable pieces. Good advice in any language, actually. Also shows uh, why um, overly strict rules on the length of com comments and things and counters is counterproductive, encourages uh, developers to write long methods to avoid writing documents. So, I do hear tons of noise in this place. Uh, anyway, long story short, uh, write methods that are short, and I write multiple methods. Keep lines short as well, uh, restricting the rule to 100 characters except for imports and comments about URLs and commands. So, you know, I don't follow that rule either, but I do try to break things up. Um, a lot of people like to put one one line of everything. Um, it's pretty hard to read, actually. So, there's no, no fault in making multiple lines out of something. Also, following normal capitalization rules, I actually do follow that. I always capitalize the name of a class. So, start with the upper letter for the name of any class or any object. Constants uh, use all small, all, excuse me, all caps for constants. Variables using lowercase letters. Uh, keeps things consistent. Everything else starts with a lowercase letter in the language. So unless it's an object, I see an uppercase, unless it's a constant value. And everything also, uh, you know, um, including package names and stuff like that should be lowercase. Extra rule, well, use um, words for acronyms, not all uppercase. So get URL, uh, not get URL. So, so actually, I'll do this part. So it's also good advice for web apps as well. Web developers. Whether or not you go to this standard or you go to this standard is completely up to you. It's just a best practice. Using Javadocs, well, I can't stand Javadocs, so I don't use Javadocs. <laughs> but uh, one of these days, uh, you'll be forced to use Javadocs because somebody will want it. Some manager who doesn't understand how much work it is will enforce it. So using Javadocs, use Javadocs from the beginning. Don't wait until you finish the code to actually document the code. Otherwise, it's too much work, which is why I don't use it. Short comments are fine, but use uh, some comments. So Javadocs I don't like because you have to put tags in there. When you put the tags in there, you know, if you don't put the tags in there correctly for each one of the comments that you want to put in there, it doesn't get automatically generated correctly. And my problem is if you don't put it in for everything, it's inconsistent. So. If you're not familiar with Java Jocks, don't worry about it, but Google it and you'll see what I'm talking about. It's a syntax that you're internally documenting your source code with so that you can click a button and it automatically generates the documentation for your code. In fact, Eclipse has a button for it to actually, and you can actually view the Java Docs as you're going through. So the advice here is to uh, do it while you go and don't wait until after you're all done to do it. Document every class represents. Uh, 
you know, make sure even if it's a small class, you're representing something that's, you're, you're going to document something that represents what it is, how it's used. And document anything public, methods, constructors, instance variables, but very rare to the public ones. Well, yeah, you want to document everything you can, especially if it's public, because then you're going to have people who want to use it. So uh, you can review the Oracle Java docs at this guidelines at this particular link right here. For purposes of the assignments that you did for this class, you don't have to use do Java docs, and you don't have to follow any of these best practices. However, it's probably not a bad idea to be familiar with them for the real world, because when you get out of academia and you start programming in the real world, you bo most companies want you to do things to a particular convention or to a particular style, and then you learn the style and then you adapt to it. And then you end up doing that for the rest of your programming career because once you get into it, you can't get out of it. So <laughs> it's a mindset. Uh, using the overrides also a good idea. I don't like to use the overrides, but using them is a good idea. Using the overrides when you override a method from a parent class is a good idea. Also using the ignore is a good thing. So the at directive won't be caught until the runtime on here. So if you want to catch it, you will be caught at runtime if you go override then you'll catch if the override doesn't make any sense. Guidelines are silent regarding interfaces, but in Java 6 or later, prefer to use an override when implementing methods from an interface as well. In fact, if you click on the option to automatically create the methods for the interface, it'll put the at overrides in there for you. A lot of people go through and they take out all this stuff, uh, which is kind of interesting, and they, it gets automatically generated for you. Use other standard annotations when warranted, but rarely depreciated, suppressed methods. Um, not a bad idea to put them in, although it kind of can get a little bit tedious. So if you're using a depreciated method to add this annotation, Eclipse will make you do this. Eclipse will prompt you, will put a little squiggly yellow comment in there and say, hey, you know what, you should put depreciated in here. I'm like, all right, I'll put depreciated in here. A lot of people don't realize what that's for. It's for the internal Java docs and for the documentation. So, so when someone looks at this later, they go, well, that was depreciated in this here. Hmm, maybe there's a better method to use. It doesn't mean you can't use it. It just means that there might be something else that changed that's associated with it. So it's a Java doc tag. I explain why, uh, why it was necessary to depreciate the code, of course. Uh, Try hard to avoid the depreciated methods. Suppress warnings, uh, messages about variables not being used, um, something generic. So generic collections are prohibited from doing extra work at runtime. So at suppressed warning unchecked, if you're using something that's not standard and you're not setting a data type as an example for an array list or something, um, and you're mixing and matching data types in the array list because you don't want to you don't want to fix it to a type or something, then you're going to get a warning message so you can suppress it. Uh, Android guidelines required a to-do comment in the cases saying why you cannot avoid the situation. <laughs> so why you did something a certain way may, may also help a programmer in the future understand why. So. Limit the scope of variables. Use narrowing scope possible. As po narrow the scope as possible, variables should be declared in the innermost block that encloses all of the use of the variable. Don't make everything global and you use it inside of everything. So a lot of people will make, um, you know, member member variables and then use them all over the place. When does it really need to be a member? Is it really a property of the class or is it a variable that you're going to use inside of a method that you created? So think smaller, think local. Initializing local variables when declared, not a bad idea as well. They teach you this in basic programming. Initialize almost all local variables. So even if it's a string, you can say hello or nothing, no string. So yes, initialize it to something, no, leave it alone. Because inevitably you'll print it to the screen without initializing it, and you'll figure out, oh, there's some piece of garbage that's on there. Also using try and catch blocks and exception handling is not a bad idea either. So. Put braces on conditions, uh, so always use braces uh, for the if statement, even if there are only one thing to do here. So here's the, here we got the opening and closing brackets. Uh, so we have if something, do something. Well, you can put this all on one line and leave out the brackets, but it's harder to see that this do something belongs to this if. So it's just another way of um, designing it. So. Guidelines uh, give small exceptions, so there's only one thing to do, and 
It's only one, you know, to, is it tolerable? Well, this in particular case is tolerable, so it's just a suggestion. You don't necessarily have to follow it for everything you're doing. So, use to do comments for temporary code. So, it's so a comment says to do for the code that needs to be changed later. So, need to fix this, need to fix that. So, you'll see this is pretty standard actually. It'll say to do or left for later or something, you know. <laughs> oh, I need to need to fix that, I need to fix this, or switch the map here, uh, or do something else. Some Eclipse notes, Eclipse puts to-dos in bold, and then uh, puts a check mark in the left-hand mar margin of the code. So, so something to check to see, did I do this, did I do that, kind of thing. Avoid finalizers, do not use finalize. The idea is to finalize, it get, gets called when the object is garbage collected. So you're going to garbage collect for the garbage collector. Not such a good thing. So you can do your cleanup work when uh, such a closing socket connection happens. So Problem, no guarantee when or even if the finalizer will actually be called. So because everything in Java is overridden by the garbage collector. And if you're looking at Android, forget it. Whatever you're doing is not going to work anyway. The Android system is going to clean it up for you. So the guidelines just don't, don't use them. Uh, it's more of an antiquated before people understood garbage collection kind of method to call. Good news, finding all are long ago fallen out of favor. So Java developers don't even know that they're that they exist actually. Um, it's kind of like uh, the Objective C release. You can actually put releases everywhere you want. Does it do anything? <laughs> it's kind of like finalized. Doesn't do anything. So conventions that don't hurt, no harm if following them. But uh, value is questionable whether or not they're using it. Putting open uh, braces with preceding code. Mm, okay. Opening and closing brackets here on separate lines. You didn't necessarily need it. Indentations, indent four spaces for blocks. Don't necessarily need to indent four spaces. You can indent one space, two spaces. Indenting eight spaces for lines. Don't necessarily use that either, but uh, it might help. So. Actually, most uh, most indentation goes five and five, so eight turns into ten and four turns into five. So, fully qualifying imports that that helps. List each one of the class names, not using an asterisk. That's a matter of choice. I actually like to do this because then I know exactly where it's coming from instead of using the asterisk. You know, this would be the good thing. This would be the okay thing. All of this stuff is questionable whether or not you know it actually really matters. Exceptions using the asterisk for Java and Java X packages is permitted in here, Java utility dot. Because otherwise there's just too many of them to list. So there's a reason why some of these shortcuts actually exist. And then there's best practices that are used in terms of that. The order of the import statements. I don't really care about the order of the import statements either, but some people do. First, you're supposed to put the Android packages, second the third party packages, and third the standard Java and Java X packages. If you look at the imports and you do the automatic, you let Eclipse put it in there for you, it actually orders it in this order. So it will actually insert it for you where it's supposed to go. Does it really matter? No. Within each group, alphabetalize things. I don't put things in alphabetical order either. In fact, I just add everything to the bottom of the list, usually. Uh, so separating groups with blank lines in between the major different sections as well. I don't do that either. Starting Java doc comments with third person verbs. <laughs> well, don't really move. Represents a something, responds to mouse clicks, deletes something. Instead of saying this class, this method. So you're talking in the third person instead of in the first person for each one of your comments. So. Believe it or not, there's people that care about this out in industry. So after, after a while, I look at this and go, does anyone ever do any of this? Some people do, I guess. Android's own docs are inconsistent, or many or most classes start with this class or similar. So, even Android is, uh, is uh, inconsistent. Some questionable conventions probably would have been better off without them. <laughs> Starting instance variables with an M, oh, I don't like this, or S for status, oh, I don't like this. But um, you see a lot of example code doing this way. So, you use an M for non public or non static fields. So everything starts out M. M first name, M is married, M or S. Sometimes you see S bigger radius, 
instead of bigger radius because it's static. So don't like that. Don't like that. There's no real benefit to it. Impact of naming convention on constructors. Hmm. Entered style and the standard style. It's pretty much the same. So. Never ignore exceptions. Uh, sometimes it doesn't really matter. So avoid empty try blocks. Try this, catch that. Sometimes you don't. You're just gonna. That's actually kind of ridiculous unless you put a to do in there. So. Uh, why ignoring exceptions rule is too strict. You can make shorter code with safe, same safety, actually. So, don't worry about the exception stuff. This is more Java programming stuff. Ignoring, uh, sometimes it's, uh, there's nothing to be done, actually. Sleep a thread. Are you really going to do an exception handling on a sleep? What if the thread doesn't sleep? You're going to notice it anywhere. So, catching generic exceptions. No, probably not such a good idea. It's a lot of extra stuff you have to put in. In fact, if you're doing exception handling, I see a lot of people that just put a de facto standard list of exceptions to catch. And you're wondering, well, then there's no code for it. Why put it? Why catch it if you're not going to put any code in there? So, Or why bother catching it if you don't think it's ever going to be thrown? Or if it does get thrown, it's going to bomb your program out. You might as well just let the program crash if that's the case. So. Arguably too strict. Well, lists each type is almost always best, so exceptions you don't expect don't get caught there. Yeah. So real failure handling is not obscured. Yeah. So don't worry about the exception stuff. It depends on how. Uh, there's some people that uh, actually there's two, pe two two types of people, two types of programmers: somebody who catches all exceptions and someone who catches none. <laughs> so. You probably, as best practice, want to find a fine line in between the two cases. Yeah, so, you know, if you're going to open up a file, you're going to catch a file, not found exception, or file, wrong type file, or name file, but are you going to catch, you know, the 25 other ones that go along with it? Probably not. You're going to use whatever it is you think you're going to use. So. All right, well, I went through that kind of on the quick side, but that was our last, last lecture, so I'm going to stop this video here. See if there's anything else. We did the tab example. We did the notify example. Uh, let me stop this recording.